Hello, everyone. This is Joe Brewer here again with you for our third lovely webinar in the learning journey for regenerative finance. It's so wonderful to be here with you all today. As you can see, I have halos on both sides because it's the middle of the day here in the tropics, 1 p.m. Central Time U.S. And I'm really excited to be with you all today. My first question, just to be sure it's working, is can you hear me okay? Is the audio working? If someone could let me know in the chat box, that would be great. Thank you. It's, I've got a very strange thing that when my headphones are plugged in, the, the microphone works. When the headphones are not plugged in, the microphone doesn't work, and we have no idea why. If it's a hardware or a software problem, because it just started last week. But hopefully this will get us through today's webinar, and that's why I've got these little things in here, even though I'm just talking to the screen at the moment. Anyway, it's lovely to be with you all today. I have heard great things about the community Zoom calls last week and the week before. So a special shout out to Tyler and Penny for Group A facilitation on Tuesdays and to Jeff and PJ for Group B facilitation on Wednesdays. We have been brainstorming together really dynamically how to organize these webinars from week to week. And we really felt that there was a process of growing and deepening and what we're talking about that really seemed like it would benefit from talking today about multi-capitalism as ecological flow, which is what we'll be discussing today. And so um, what I want to uh, remind us, of course, the normal housekeeping is during the presentation part of our, our discussion, there's an ask a question button right here that you can pose questions and then vote for the questions you'd like to hear afterwards during the discussion. We will tailor the community Zoom calls this week to the topic of today's webinar. And we'll also be sharing these webinars publicly after the community Zoom calls are over uh, to make them available to the larger Earth Regenerators community and anyone else who wants to see them. So today, what I want to do is set the stage by saying that we actually have a very natural progression in what we're doing. So the first week, we gave a kickoff to the learning journey we briefly gave a working definition of what finance is, what regeneration is, the planetary context in which we're doing this work. And we talked about how regenerative finance is the coordination and communication of value that is exchanged within an economy that functions like a living system. And that that's what we're trying to build. And we're doing this by focusing on the social dynamics of our conversations and the groups in this learning journey so that we can build the capacity to run real life projects and support each other to create regenerative economics models and do things that make a difference in the real world. And this led us to the second week, the webinar last week where we talked about pro-social and we talked about how pro-social is a kind of regenerative finance, that when you have a group of people who have a lot of trust and generosity, altruism, uh, that they work together really well, that this creates a flow of value that is naturally coordinated by the healthy relationships of the people themselves. So a pro-social group is a model of regenerative finance, even if no money exchanges hands, because finance is about the exchange and coordination of value, not about money per se. But this leaves open a really interesting question how can we clearly understand the different kinds of value that exist within these pro-social groups that enable us to do regenerative things? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get ourselves rolling and just jump right in. So let me share the screen and then we'll get started. So today's topic is multi-capitalism as ecological flow. And you can already see that I'm hinting at what we're gonna talk about with this bright, bright, vibrant network graph that shows there's a diversity of different things all in the same space. And they have lots of relationships to each other, lots of ways they can interact, lots of the ways that one of them can be dependent on another, lots of ways that one of them can support another. So this visual representation tells us that the red 
balls could interact with the blue ones, which could interact with the purple ones, which could interact with the green ones through direct or indirect relationships. And this dynamic web of diverse interactions is what gives rise to the complexity of real world economies. And we're gonna to talk today about how we can more clearly understand these kinds of very complex relationships so that we can intentionally shape how they arise and how they change within our own groups. So with that said, let's get started. Recall that in our very first webinar, we said we're going to focus on the conversational dynamics of our learning journey. And we're gonna notice when something valuable happens, like I was comforted by what that person said, or they shared a link to a video and I watched it, it was so useful, I learned so much. The value is continually being created and flowing between the members of these of the group and the community Zoom calls and these webinars and so on. And if we pay attention to how this value is created, then we can design for how to do it better and learn how we're already doing it well. Last week, we layered on top of this Eleanor Ostrom's eight core design principles, saying that if we understand how value is created, where the group functions as a commons or a common pooled asset, that we can start to see how the group works well or doesn't work well when certain criteria are met. Is there a shared identity and purpose? Do we monitor agreed behaviors? Did we even agree to behaviors? Do we have decision-making processes that are fair and inclusive and so on? There are these ways of managing a commons that give us more clarity so we can say, wow, value was created and it flowed because these conditions were met where there was a time when value flowed, but later it broke down and stopped flowing. And we notice, because we're aware of them, that one of these conditions is no longer met, but it was being met early on. Maybe we all had a shared sense of purpose, but then our behaviors changed and we started thinking about different things. And we ended up having more than one purpose without clarity that this context had changed. So now we can start to see these kinds of subtle, patterns as social dynamics within our conversations. And that's really helpful. But what is value? And how does it get created? And I mean, in general, not just in our social dynamics and our conversations, what is value and how does it get created? And how does it move around? Now, I want to say here that there's a lot I could say about values, social values, related to community, identity, individualism, materialism, and all kinds of things. And I want to keep the conversation today focused on a specific subset of values, which is values that arise in living systems. So we're going to think about very concretely how ecosystems function and how value is understood as ecological health and well-being for the members of an ecosystem. And this is just a way for us to focus on seeing how these ecosystems are healthy and how they work and save the conversation about social values for another time because it's so rich and so alluring that it would pull us away from the topic of today's conversation. And we may end up discussing it in another webinar or at some other time in the learning journey. But for now, I really wanna focus on how can we have a shared understanding of value, how value is created and how it moves around in living systems. So with that said, Let's talk about food chains, or what are sometimes more accurately called food webs. And so a thing to know about a food web, as you can see in this diagram, is that there are different levels of energy exchange as you move from the primary producers, the plants, that use photosynthesis to make their plant bodies into uh, food and energy directly taken from the sun, to the primary consumers, which is one level away one functional step away from producing this food themselves. And these are the animals that eat the plants. And then you can have a secondary consumer, which is the animal that eats that animal. So here we have the grasshopper that eats the grass and the bird that eats the grasshopper. What's important about this is that energy moves through these food webs uh, within any ecosystem. And there are different functions and different relationships. So for example, the amount of energy that is captured in plants is 10 times more than the amount of energy that can be held in the bodies of every primary consumer. And that means each primary consumer has to eat a lot of grass. 
But when you go one level higher to the bird that eats the grasshopper, the bird has to eat a lot of bugs to be able to live throughout its day. So each bird is taking energy from each grasshopper. Each grasshopper is taking energy from a lot of plants. And what happens is you have a loss of energy stored in the bodies of these animals as you go up levels. The only reason this matters for us here is that we need to understand that trophic flow, which is this movement of energy across the levels of consumption, of who's consuming whom in a food web, that this is a way of seeing how value is created. The plants develop and improve specific places, building the soil, storing carbon in them, creating surface areas on their roots for microorganisms and fungi, and creating food in their bodies that can be eaten by other animals, the primary consumers. These are all forms of value creation. So plants are able to take sunlight and um, chemicals from the atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, and they create the value of a food supply for the primary consumers. So you can see here that when we think in terms of living systems, value is the capacity to be alive and to thrive. So it's food, it's having a niche or a home or a safe environment to, to reproduce in, it's producing offspring, it's anything related to the health and well-being, as well as the continuation of life for any living organism. And with food webs, we can see that this is grounded in the trophic flow, meaning the movement of energy and nutrients through food webs. So this is one way of seeing value gets created at each level to support the next level, and it moves along through, in this case, through patterns of consumption. But there are other ways of thinking about how energy moves and how value is created in living systems. And this is a graphic that is pretty abstract and maybe I understand it better than most of you because I have a master's degree in atmospheric science. This is a graphic representation of what's called the Earth's energy budget, which is when you take all of the amount of energy coming into the Earth's atmosphere from the sun, and then you ask how much is reflected back into space, how much of it gets to the land surface, how much is absorbed and re-emitted by clouds, and you end up seeing that there's this budget where all of the energy leaving the atmosphere needs to equal all of the energy coming in. And if they're not equal, then the atmosphere gets warmer, which is why we call um, climate change global warming, because there's more energy being trapped in the heat trapping gases of the Earth's atmosphere. What's important for us about this is that there are two primary sources of value in this system. One of them is the sun, which provides a huge amount of incoming energy for creating life. And the other is the surface and the atmosphere of the earth, where all of this energy from the sun is able to support living systems. And what's interesting about the earth's energy budget is that it is the foundation of all life on earth. So said another way, if you look at the planet as separated into all of the non-living parts and the living parts, what's called the geosphere and the biosphere, what you'll see is that the world's largest regenerative economy is the biosphere itself. And the biosphere can be understood as creating value from having places on the Earth's surface, which includes in the ocean of the Earth, uh, where life is able to thrive. And a lot of this energy is produced by solar energy, creating those primary producers that we learned about in trophic flows and food webs. So here we can see that value is created in the planetary system of the Earth and the Sun together, and it moves around through the Earth through its dynamic systems of atmosphere, lithosphere, which is all the rocks, cryosphere, which is all the ice, hydrosphere, which is all the water that is not an ice form, and together these make it possible for the Earth's biosphere to exist. So here we can see that there's this huge value creation and moving economy, which is the Earth's biosphere and we can understand it by understanding trophic flow in any ecosystem. And this is the largest scale regenerative economy we know of because this is the only planet we know of that has life on it. What's interesting though, is when we go to human systems and say, in the human context, how do humans do the same thing? How does value get created and how does it flow? And here what we can see is humans are living beings and we're able to create actions just like the plants create capacities, like the body of the plant can be eaten. What humans have is a kind of information ecology. We have a way that we understand the distribution of energy. 
in our environments. And we have ways of moving that information around. So we have a built infrastructure of things like a forest economy or an urban environment. And this built infrastructure has constraints on what kinds of knowledge and what kinds of skills exist. But all of that knowledge and skills together are mobilized and they flow. But they flow through pro-social processes, meaning social capital or the ability for people to trust each other, to engage in exchanges with each other, to work together, to buy and sell, and so on and so forth, which are all forms of social capital, <laughs> enable the flow of value as it's exchanging. And the coordination of that flow is the financial flow itself. So here what I'm saying is the way that ecosystems move energy as trophic flows, which grows all the way to the level of the biosphere of the entire planet, has a functional analog, which means we have structures that are different in their details, but similar in their functions that work in human contexts. And human cultures are this blend of structured environments and know-how and skills and the ability to work together to make things happen that create and spread value across all of a human economy. And here's what's really interesting is the flow of regenerative finance moves through many different kinds of capital. And this is the idea of multi-capital or multi-capitalism. And I've just named some that are my favorites here. There are different lists depending on different people. But you can see, for example, that there's natural capital, which is anything that the natural environment, the ecosystems of the earth could be used to invest in or to create capabilities in an economy. There's political capital, which is the ability to rally support, to garner power and to influence and make decisions and act on those decisions in an effective way. There's social cap capital, which is the ability to draw upon the trust and goodwill of people to work together and make things happen. There's knowledge capital, which is things we know how to do or things that we know how they work that we can apply to create technologies, to create solutions, to build a better house, to grow food in a healthier way, to know how to build soils. There's this capacity of human knowledge that enables us to create value in our economies. There's institutional capital, which is the ways that humans have organized resources and frameworks of decision-making that allow us to leverage those as existing things. I don't have to create a hospital every time I get sick. I can visit a hospital that's already been created. And it's sort of a mix of natural capital, social capital, political capital, and knowledge capital all together in a social organization that functions that I can go to and depend upon. And any time these institutional structures have been created, they provide institutional capital. But there's another kind of capital that my friend at the Common Land Foundation call inspirational capital, which is basically the ability to engage someone's heart, to speak to them authentically, to motivate them to action, to cultivate their dreams, to create an energy and flow of people, to create something new that doesn't exist yet, and they need to believe in it before they act on it. And they need to act on it to make it more likely that it's going to come into being. And this is what we call inspirational capital. What's interesting is the flow of regenerative finance is all of the value that's created and that flows through these different kinds of capital. Here's what's interesting. Which capital is missing? Financial capital, of course. Our current globalized economy is a giant financial system which more than 80% of it is extractive, just hoarding money for rich people to get richer while destroying the Earth's biosphere. So most of the financial capital of the world right now is ecological debt taken from the destruction of the Earth's biosphere and turned into wealth and power for a tiny elite of humans. So most financial capital in the world is not regenerative finance. But what I think is really interesting is when we see the flow of regenerative finance in this way, it is this system of flow that is financial capital. So financial capital could be named as one of these circles, but we can also see it as whatever capacity exists for value to be created and to flow among these other forms of capital, which means we design regenerative finance by looking at these other kinds of capital and then asking what kinds of financial tools 
financial relationships, financial structures would enable these different kinds of capital to flow in regenerative ways. And then regenerative capital is what emerges as that coordination of flow as the value is created and moves through the system. Which is interesting to pull financial capital out in this way. So we design for flow and designing for flow is the design of finance. So you see how that works? Very interesting. There's something else I wanna say here, which is that there are, is a way of understanding economies and ecosystems based on the science of complexity or what's called co complex adaptive systems. For example, if you want to Google it, there's the Atlas, there's the Atlas of Economic Complexity, which is a website that looks at how economic complexity arises and has created a, a really powerful way of comparing economies based on their complexity. And basically what they do is they look at the systemic capacities of each economy. And they look at it in the ability to create and follow through on outcomes. So for example, I used to live in Seattle, Washington, which is a very vibrant technological economy, also an arts and food culture economy. And if you ask what abilities are there to create, and you'll see there are a lot of great restaurants, which means there's a food infrastructure that can bring high quality local food to the restaurants. And there are chefs that know how to prepare delicious meals. These are two different ways of seeing the ability to create and follow through on outcomes. But also you have companies like Starbucks, Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, who are able to recruit talent in their labor pool and their employees, pay them lots of money, and have them build technological infrastructure to do all kinds of things, which makes it a very dynamic, adaptive economy. So what's interesting is when you look at the systemic capabilities and you say, what can this economy create? And how does it follow through on what it creates to create outcomes that are valuable? These are the affordances of the economy. These are aspects that the economy is able to do in its structure and its capabilities. So if we practice seeing the flow of value in ecosystems, we can start to see the flow of value in human economies, which are just another kind of ecosystem. And we do it here by looking at the ability to create and follow through on outcomes. So Boeing, for example, is the ability to create and follow through on producing commercial airlines, creating airplanes, which is very different from another economy that's got a really strong music scene and that creates fantastic music that spreads all over the world. So you see these different systemic capacities are contextual to their place and each economy is different in which combination it has. So as we look in an existing economy and try to make it more regenerative, we need to understand what systemic capacities are available for us to work with as we try to create these regenerative financial flows. So this is something that I'm sort of pushing into the future. We want to understand that there are different kinds of value existing in any human system, which you could name as different kinds of capital if you wanted to use that term. And when you look at the coordination of how they flow, you start to see systemic capacities. And this is how you design the emergence or the change in an economy to become more regenerative. So to give a couple comp concrete examples where I live here in Barichara, Colombia, we have lots of local craft skills like the ability to construct earthen houses, a lot of ancestral knowledge about how to prepare plants and engage in weaving to make baskets like the ones you see here. We have a lot of people who train in permaculture by learning how to cultivate soil, do agroforestry, engage in reforestation, and so on. And these are just three, there are a lot more. But if you just start mapping out what kinds of knowledge and what kinds of skills to follow through on actions exist in your economy, then you can start to use that knowledge to create value flow by saying, how could I use my social capital to engage the natural capital of this environment, you know, the types of plants that are here, connected with knowledge capital, which is the know-how of how to grow and process those plants to produce things that are valuable, like bioclimatic housing or um, material appropriate local uh, baskets or storage materials. You see how you start to think of these movements of value from one form of capital to another and see how they flow and you are thinking in terms of regenerative finance. By the way, this works at the scale 
of entire landscapes. The Common Land Foundation has been doing this by taking four kinds of capital, which they call the four returns from landscape restoration, and they name them as return on inspiration, return on social capital, return on natural capital, and return on financial capital. And what they find is that by taking these four kinds of returns, you can actually map out an entire landscape into zones. Some of them are just for ecological restoration, which are mostly about creating inspiration and engagement. Some of them are mixed zones of ecological restoration and economic activity, which they call combined zones, which blend social capital, uh, inspirational capital, and natural capital. And some of them are purely financial, meaning you make economic investments to create economic returns, and the ecological benefits are secondary if they exist at all. And this just creates a way to map them onto landscapes and look at them differently. And they're now doing this in eight large-scale landscape restoration projects. I just wanted to show you this example to say that you can go to the geography of, a, of an area and create zones of economic or ecological development. And you can map the different kinds of capital to the zones and then look at how the value is created and flows among them. And this is a way of seeing what the Common Land Foundation is doing. So this is something that is being experimented with at the scale of 1 million hectares in Spain, where Common Land has one of their projects. So this is not just me talking in the abstract. They're really doing it and have been for several years. So I want to stop for a moment and say, we have been talking today about how there are different kinds of value that exist in an ecosystem. And they move around as energy, processes, functions, different kinds of value that create and sustain life. And when we understand those flows, those trophic flows, those ecological flows, then we can see how value is created and how it moves. And then human systems, when we think of different kinds of capital or different kinds of value that exist, we can convert from one to another. Then we can start to do things like this. We can design a bank for regenerative investments using the land as the bank. This, what I'm showing you now, is the conceptual model for the Earth Regeneration Fund. And what later we started prototyping is the Barichara Regeneration Fund for a bioregional scale investment platform. And it starts by seeing the land as the bank. And say, so, well, what kinds of value are stored and exchanged? What kinds of investments can we make and get returns from the land? Well, we can retain water and build soils. We can grow capacities of the local economy by training people and providing livelihoods. We can cycle nutrients and create material flows like growing the plants that become the baskets or gathering the mud that becomes the mud houses and so on. And we can provide housing and grow food, resilience, community welfare, potable and drinkable water. And all of this we weave together across landscapes. When we do this, we're investing in regenerative capacities by building the capacities of the land, treating the people as part of the land. Because here the land is all of the trophic flow, the flow of energy and nutrients through the place where the land is. If the people live there, that includes the material and energetic flow through those people. And now we have an integrated, holistic way of thinking what a bank is. A bank is the collection of value created and stored in landscapes that can be activated as regenerative economies. When we think this way, we can build a financial system that is inherently regenerative, which is what we're doing now in Barichara, Colombia. The way that we thought about designing this was to build a portfolio, which notice what we do. We learn to work as a functional group. There's that pro-social process we talked about last week. And we raise money to acquire plots of land to regenerate, like a forest reserve that we completed the purchase of last week, 3.2 hectares of heavily degraded land that we're going to reforest. We can also partner with existing projects on other land and create a network of projects, which then creates a port portfolio of diverse risks, divert capabilities, diverse ben benefits. And we measure how value is created and how it flows regeneratively across this portfolio of projects, the way I was describing earlier. Natural capital working with social capital, social capital working with knowledge capital, all that working with political capital or creating political capital and so on. And we do this to evolve into a platform of cooperation 
which is the network of projects across the landscape. So this is something we're prototyping and building right now in Columbia. But I just wanted to show you that this way of working in small groups has a fractal structure and you can do the same thing at larger scales. In this case, the scale of an entire bioregion or the size of an entire territorial economy, which is what we're working to do here in Columbia. Taking a pause for a second. It's a lot to take in. What I've just been talking about is a lot to take in. So I wanna remind us how we structured these learning journeys, where we said the learning journey for the next two months would be that we would learn how to be regenerative by focusing on social dynamics. And we would create pro-social groups or said another way, we would create regenerative projects together. But we want these regenerative projects to work as a network, as an ecosystem. So what we wanna do is cultivate these regenerative economic capacities in our own groups to birth regenerative projects into the world or if regenerative projects already exist to improve them and strengthen them and bring capacities to them so that they can work as networks, not because the projects are networked, but because the pro-social groups of human beings are networked. And we can create regenerative flow of moving from one kind of capital to another within regenerative projects and across regenerative projects through the social dynamics of our groups. Does that make sense? I'll visualize it a little differently. If we think of the flow of regenerative finance as being all of the value created and moved through different kinds of capital, then we can take that way of thinking and apply it to the pro-social groups, where each pro-social group has different kinds of, of capital. And those different kinds of capital are arranged and structured and distributed in different ways in each pro-social group. So as the pro-social groups interact with each other, they activate and convert and transform different kinds of capital across all of the projects represented by the members of those groups. So we can create ecological flow culturally and in the more than human ecological world. We can create ecological flow by actively guiding the interactions among different kinds of capital. But all of this is built on the foundation of pro-social groups that cooperate with each other. So notice how if we want to bring a forest back to life, we have to get the community to come together. We have to regenerate the human world to regenerate the more than human world. The destruction of the more than human world came about because we destroyed, or our ancestors did, destroyed the regenerative aspects of human culture. So you see how this works. The flow of regenerative finance is ecological flow of different kinds of value stored within the ecosystem of human relationships applied to regenerative projects. And when we understand this way of thinking, we can see better the logic of this learning journey. We need to learn what regenerative finance is by forming pro-social groups. And then we create regenerative finance projects by helping those pro-social groups to create regenerative projects. And as we understand the value flow within those groups and across those projects, we are a community of practice doing regenerative finance. Whether or not we use money, because the financial capital is the flow of value through the whole system. So, our focus in this learning journey is to form pro-social groups. We want these pro-social groups to give birth to networks of regenerative projects. And so the way I'd like to start our Q&A and our discussion today is, how are we doing so far? Does all of this make sense? Are we structuring the knowledge in a cumulative way that makes sense? Do you see how multi-capitalism, how ecological flow, how these relate to being pro-social? And do you see how that relates to regenerative economics? And now all of this together is regenerative finance. That's the topic of our discussion right now. And so we are going to really um, have an opportunity now to work on building these, um, these different models together. So that's the presentation part of our discussion. I hope that this makes sense to all of you. And I'd love to start a discussion together so what I'd really like to do is um, I'd really like to start a discussion about how are we doing so far? Um, because someone's saying, 
some people can see me, but for some reason Tyler can't. Weird. Um, well, that's okay. Everyone else sees me. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll wave on Tyler's behalf and hopefully the video comes back. Um, what I'd love to do is start a discussion about this. Like, how much sense does this make? Um, do you understand what we mean by multi-capitalism? There are different ways that value is stored and created, that investments can be made, that we can make investments from, that exist within human and larger ecological systems. And when we understand these ecological flows, and we watch them happening, or we actively intentionally create them, we're able to be the embodiment of regenerative finance. So what I'm curious right now is I'm gonna just like, um, pose, a, pose a poll here. Is um, this making sense? I'm gonna give you three options. Yes, no, sort of. What I'd love to do is just, just answer this little poll. Is this making sense? Because um, I'm just curious if I've confused you entirely or if we're sort of getting it. This is just like a little litmus test. I love that there are no no's so far. So that's really helpful. Oh, there's one no. Um, that's okay. Um, maybe whoever has the no, if you have any specific requests, like, I don't understand this, um, you could just drop that directly into the chat box in addition to the questions being asked. Um, or if you don't want to um, draw attention to yourself, that's fine too. I'm not meaning to put you on the spot. But let's see. We have a question here. Hey, from Todd. Um, Todd, did that mean that you wanted to have a conversation about something or were you uh, um, intending to pose a question here? Just curious because uh, cause that's it's not a question there. Or maybe you accidentally hit send um, before it was published. But um, ah, I got it. Well, go, go ahead and pose your question then and we'll just let that one sit. Um, so yeah, so what I think is really helpful here is to see how we can get more and more clarity by adding in more information about structure and flow. And as we do this cumulatively, we have a better sense of us together having a shared understanding. So that when we go into the community Zoom calls and when we start creating or improving projects, we have a shared language. There are different kinds of value that you could call multi-capitalism. So you could look at the natural capital and how it's related to knowledge capital doesn't matter much if you have plants that you don't know how to use. But if you know how to use them, that's really useful. And so, um, so I think it's really helpful for, have these, for us to have these concepts. And I see that Abel's posing a question in the chat box instead of in the ask question box. Awesome. I can roll with that. Um, what I would say with real world examples is first we had the example that was used in the call last week where I had to rally together money from ATM machines from half a dozen friends to get cash to complete a purchase for part of a, a land deal, where you could see that we converted social capital into financial capital in order to maintain trust in a process with a set of people, which means we gained the political capital to continue going in a process by leveraging social capital to attract and gather financial capital. So that's an example. And yes, Gail, those people got paid back the next opportunity to accumulate a whole bunch of ATM fees, withdrawing money from the ATM machines to pay them back. Um, but, uh, but you can see in that example that there's financial capital, there's institutional capital because the ATM machines existed, that we could leverage them. There was social capital because we had a set of people who trusted in us that we could draw upon. We had political capital, which was that the people that we were trying to make the deal with didn't collapse the negotiation and let us continue, which restored the social capital with them. And there's this dynamic way that for three hours, all of these different kinds of capital were flowing from one to another to enable this thing to happen. So, that, so that's one real world example that can show you a little bit of how this works. But you can also see it in the way that our host team is managing these calls every week. So we've got five people, Tyler, Penny, Jeff, and PJ, and myself. And there's enough social capital that, that the other four trust me to run these webinars. And we have enough knowledge capital among all four of us to be able to come up with ideas together for the structure of the webinars, the structure and facilitation of the Zoom calls. We have enough institutional capital 
to run these webinars, to use Zoom calls, to use the Mighty Networks platform. And all of these are built on inspirational capital, which people feel really motivated to come here. They get a lot of meaning and they keep coming back. So all of these other supports of our knowledge, our trust in each other, and these technology tools wouldn't mean anything if no one was showing up and continuing to engage. So these are different kinds of capital that exist in the flow of this learning journey. So we can go on and on, I think. I can give lots of examples. Um, but, uh, but there's just two of them to get us started. So I see that Abel's saying, but essentially what he described as social capital flowing is money donations flowing from supporters to body Char regeneration fund. Well, that's not what I was saying in this moment. That's something that happened to, re to attract all the donations back in December and January. What I'm actually saying here is that we had a moment where there, was, there were seven siblings we were buying land from. One of them needed one seventh of the money for the land and they required it to be in cash but they were only in body chara for three hours. And we had to find a way to get the cash to them when we could not go to our bank and withdraw the money because the institutions were broken. So when there was not institutional capital, we leveraged our knowledge capital, which is we knew how to use the ATM machines and their daily withdrawal limits. We had social capital that we could go to seven friends and ask each of them individually to go to the ATM machine and max out how much money they could withdraw and give us cash and then we carried that cash, which was part of the institutional capital of the ATM machines, to enable us to give this big pile of cash to that person. So you see how all of this, we understood the different kinds of capital that were involved, and that's how we were able to imagine the solution in the middle of the crisis. It's like, oh crap, how do we come up with 16 million Colombian pesos, about 5,000 US dollars, in the next two hours in cash when the person doesn't have a bank account? We leverage social capital, knowledge capital, institutional capital, bypassed broken institutions, and brought it all together. And trust was the juice, was the lubricant of the whole thing. So that's a really nice real world example of regenerative finance, just to give you a sense of how it works. So um, seeing a few questions coming in here that we can start to discuss. And I, I think I'll maybe start with Gail's question and then go to David's because Gail's is a little more um, uh, more general and David's a little more more specific. Abel's we sort of already answered, so I'll bypass it for now. And I'll invite Gail onto the screen. So Gail is asking, how do we create new creative types of regenerative finance? And I'll start answering by saying, do what I just did, which is recognize the different kinds of value that exist and put them into motion. Like, oh, I have friends who trust in me enough to loan me money, and I can ask them. So see, part of this is to have the eyes to see what different kinds of value exists that are available to us. But I'm curious what you think, Gail, coming from a, a more traditional fundraising background with NGOs, how is this similar? How is this different? Like, just well, curious I how you think of that lens. I've been really frustrated by the traditional way of raising money, particularly for my own nonprofit, because um, we're doing really great work with not a lot of money, and we have submitted numerous grant proposals, and we haven't gotten any. Any funding we've gotten are from people who have either met us personally or already knew us personally, who have the resources, and they've become pretty... Um, uh, you know, ongoing supporters. Even the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service likes us and have given our projects money. But when we send proposals out to these funders who don't know who we are, we never get any money from them. And so it's like, uh, and yet if we could raise more, oh my God, we could do so much more and, and we're having an impact and we can show that we're having an impact. It's very frustrating. And, and, and maybe I can't see beyond the way I've learned for over 20 years to raise money, you know? And, and so I really wanna know how to take these other kinds of capital and help us find other ways to raise the money. Because right now we just need money. There's no alternatives to that. So I well, guess, yeah. One thing I can see in what you've said is that you already know how to turn social capital into financial capital. 
So you've already built trusting, long-standing relationships with people who continue to give money to support your projects. And there's a real lesson in that. Um, I once wrote an article called Why Crowdfunding is Not About Money. It's about building community, which is exactly what you just said. And so that's one insight is you're better at building social capital than at building financial capital. And that's okay. Build social capital. And one thing you can do is find ways to bypass the need for money. Like you might have, you might build institutional capacities in a place where you want to take action because you have knowledge of how to do it that allows you to do things that require less money. And that's actually the flow of the different kinds of capital. So I suspect that just having these concepts to think with will give you more clarity about how much you've already been doing this. Um, I guess, although some of it, you know, I mean, we already can do things inexpensively because of colonialism. Because we work in countries where you could pay someone $8 a day and they'll do the work. Where I live, you could, nobody would work for that. And, and therefore we're benefiting in a way from colonization, which is not what we want, you know, and, and we're in a way supporting that. Um, but otherwise, you know, some people do the work as volunteers, but most people they need income and the income we give them is better than none or a good alternative to doing the illegal wildlife trade. Um, but it's still far from ideal. And, and without the people power, the work couldn't get done. So it, it still yeah, doesn't yeah. feel right, you know? Yeah, yeah, maybe if you mute yourself a second, we'll see what's coming through. Uh, uh, this might actually be a good time to jump over to David's question, because I think David's question relates to the, the systemic problem you're, you're describing right now. Okay. So how about if we jump off, I'll jump on with David and we'll continue on that theme. Yeah, and are other people still hearing the echo effect from me now that um, now that we've stopped that question? It looks like it's good. Okay, I think that they may have just been the reverb from the sound. So I know that, uh, where was the question David asked? Here it is. Okay, so David, I'll invite you onto the screen. David was asking, how can we transition economies towards regenerative activity? Thinking about the billions of people who participate in it on a daily basis. And you can see how this relates to what Gail was saying that they need to pay money to people to do work because people need money to live. And they're trying to leverage money and their programs into the transitions that David is alluding to in his question. So, um, so this is a bridge between the two questions. So David, I wonder, mm -hmm. first of all, if you have thoughts about this question in general or what you just heard Gail say um, as, as we start yeah. to try and parse this. <laughs> Hey, yeah, I'll definitely say both. I was like, I'm looking at her question in mind. I'm like, they're very similar, but different lenses. Cause it's like, uh, I feel like we're getting a good sense of the theoretical and like how the framework of this kind of stuff works and um, ways of evaluating certain situations in real life. But then I'm like, you know, on a very practical level, I'm like, how can we get, you know, the local food producers to be participating in this and the landholders and like all the, the practical questions I know it's an eight week journey. So I'm like, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, like, but I'm like, it brings up every time uh, because I'm like, now we got the lens. So I'm like, how do we practically bring people in? Um, you know, I'll say I'm like, you know, it's, I, obviously it starts with like pro-social and like all these things that we're learning about just like good, you know, collaborative behaviors, but on a practical level, like how do we start bringing people in? Yeah, I think one piece of this is, um, if those of us who are practicing together get better at doing this, then people will start to notice that what we're doing is, is beautiful and that it works and we'll attract more people to it through the inspirational part that, that um, Common Land Foundation had, had named. So one way we do this is we work together. I mean, we meaning those of us doing these regenerative things, we work together better. And as we work together better, in a way we sort of, isolate ourselves from the problem of trying to bring other people in, meaning we just get better at what we're doing. And 
This is a permaculture principle that Jeff Lawton in particular really celebrates. Um, for those who don't know, Jeff Lawton is one of the um, famous permaculture instructors from Australia. And he makes a point to say, start small, improve, optimize, and only scale after you really got it. And, and that's a really mm -hmm. good prototyping strategy in general. So if we get really good at this in small groups, people are going to notice what our small groups do. And they're going to want to they're going to want to get more involved in it in some ways. And it's going to help make it easier to build those bridges. And that doesn't mm -hmm. so I'm bypassing your question in a way, because we really still haven't answered the question of the transitions, partly because it's a predicament and we're not going to do it for the billions of people. Yeah. But but at the same time, we need to do it for a lot more people. So um mm -hmm. I'm not meaning to avoid the question, but just really trying to give us a grounded place to practice answering it. Um, does that make oh, sense? Oh, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's better than like, a re here's the answer, you know, because we don't have that yet. We're figuring it out. Um, like another consideration is also like, as we're building this resilience on a small scale, it's like there are certain communities that are getting super affected by this stuff already. You know, like in my country and state, like black, brown, indigenous, uh, you know, low income communities are like, getting the full brunt of it while like, you know, these rich people that are causing the financial collapse and everything, they're more protected. Um, like even with, you know, like everything that's going on now. So it's like, I don't know, creating bridges in certain spaces feels really important. Like, so it's not like, you know, it's in a sense, like we see things collapsing, but it's like also, um, it's like, we don't want to perpetuate like the environmental injustices and like which groups are like, you know, genocided on by colonialism it's like that's got to change too so like i don't yeah. know <laughs> well you know i have a really interesting example of this that came up 10 minutes before the webinar when my friend one of my friends here called me and was telling me she lives in alpino which is this rural neighborhood it's one of the poorest places in all of the area around barichara it's below the town which means all of the toilet water and the ref the, the poop and the pee are dumped directly in the river without mm. processing any of it and that water runs across the land of Alpino, which is the poorest people where there's like cancer outbreaks there and all kinds of bad stuff. And those people can't trust the, the corrupt mayor's office to fix anything. Mm -hmm. The corrupt mayor created this problem to make money off of privatized water. So the, the thing that happened on the call was this woman who organizes a community food gar a community garden that they organized during the pandemic last year, she knows that we're starting to create a food forest in the Bio Parque, which is up in Barichara. And she said, I told this to some of the people here and they'd like to do it with the school and with the children. They're interested mm. in learning how to build a food forest. Could we come up and see your project? We're like, well, yeah, but we're just getting started. There's not much to see yet. But you can see how instead of waiting for the rich people to do it or trying to get the mayor to do it or some other thing, we're just going to go directly to the people who are capable of taking, creating autonomy and making their own decisions mm. and say, well, what if we just don't teach them so much, but facilitate their capacity to do what they mm. know they need to do. Yeah, it's inspirational capital for the win. Thank you, BJ, right there in the chat box. <laughs> that this could mean the, the elementary school kids in the poorest part of the whole territory could create an exemplary yeah. food forest. Mm -hmm. And they're solving their own problems. And all of those injustices you were describing, they're very present here too. Uh, this is just an example of how, how when we create the social and information flow, knowledge, place, infrastructure, inspiration, trust, that these flows can happen. And they're not asking for money from the Body Trial Regeneration Fund. We may end up finding mm -hmm. a proposal to give to them, but they just want to learn together. The financial part is secondary. So just mm. want to name that as a, a real life example <laughs> where this stuff is flowing right now. Um, and you know, 10 meters away from me on the left is a great food forest project, permaculture project one of our friends is doing. So we're going to bring the kids here to right. see it. So all this stuff is like we build the capacity and leverage it, which is what mm. I know you're trying to do where you are. So yeah, in like yeah. In empowering those communities too to like make their own choices is, it seems real key. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thanks, David. And great question. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Onward. Yeah. Um, let's see the next questions. I'm noticing that we're getting close to time, just being aware of that. Um, so looking at the questions and thinking, um, 
Abel had asked a question about the social capital flowing and as donations to the body char fund. I, I kind of feel like we covered that one already. I hope that's okay. If not, let me know. Uh, another question that got voted up here is by Todd. It says, I'm a bit confused about your use of non-financial capital. One of the benefits of cold hard money is money is that it comes with commonly understood sets of rules and that it operates without a face. How does regenerative finance address interactions with those who do not care about um, your no financial values? Well, I'll, I'll invite Todd onto the screen and start to answer this by saying, I'm not saying that um, there's no money and this isn't even an anti-money position. It's that money is a tool that coordinates value, but only if the money is trusted. And one of the ways you can measure the collapse of an economy is hyperinflation, which is when the social capital and the financial system goes away. When people no longer trust the money system, then money becomes worthless. Um, so money is actually bolstered by trust. Um, so interestingly, money stores value as a kind of social capital invested in the institutional capital of the financial system. And when that goes away, money is useless. So this isn't specifically an anti-money point of view. It's just a recognition of what money is and what it does in relation to these other ways of seeing value. But yeah. I'll stop there and <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> but the difference is that uh, the value of money is distributed through the entire population that is using the money. So if one area collapses due to lack of trust, like everyone in that area can still participate in the larger market and just shift their demand to that other area and pull until things stabilize again. If you have a local system of trust and one key individual in that chain of tr trusts collapses, then you potentially end up with a system where everyone has all of their social value just disappearing up until up into nothing and how does regenerative finance then how is that separate from just social networking and leveraging social network structures for generating labor? It's a really good question. And one way to broaden it from the social is to go into the natural capital space, where we can see that if you have more natural capital, you have more capacity for creating value. So as an example, here where we are, all the topsoils are gone. They cut down the forest decades ago. When it rains, there's heavy rain and it's really steep slopes. So all the topsoil is gone. It's washed away with erosion. Uh, after the deforestation. So here's a place where the capacity to produce things of value is lower because the land is less productive than it used to be. So by restoring the soils, you, there's more ability to produce things of value within the economy. So this is an example where it's not social capital that's generating value, it's natural capital. And so the question becomes how to help people see different kinds of capital when they're used to having a narrower definition. So if someone says, well, there's no money, what do we do? Like, well, actually we have a bunch of people with pickaxes and we can go out and dig ditches and store water and start building soil. And over time, this will grow our capacity to do things of value. Most people won't know what the hell you're talking about because they can't see the ecological capital. You know, they don't see that that's actually building an economy. So part of this is about making visible aspects of value creation that in the narrowness of reducing so many things to money, which is really a phenomenon of the last 40 or 45 years, mm. and the explosion of, of individual finance starting in the 70s and financializing a bunch of things has created this overemphasis on money and then the inability to see these other forms of value. So part of this is just rebalancing that it's like an eco-literacy training and ecological economics. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's transformative because we have so many more things to work with than money, even if Can we I... may still need money. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just follow up with another? Um, how do, do you ensure that the people participating in this value creation actually reap the benefits of what they're creating? 
I mean, there is the grander scale of thing that we need to save the Earth. But also, there's also high risk that you regenerate some landscape and then you just have some financial hawks just swooping in and taking it through some government loopholes or like, how do you specifically protect what you are trying to create? This goes back to Eleanor Ostrom's principles from last week. Mm. The group that's managing the commons needs to be able to collectively govern and have authority to govern what is shared in common. So it might be mm. like a, a water management board for managing the water of a local place and the local people manage their water. And a concrete way that I've seen this come about in Colombia, just specific to the kinds of corruption that exist here, but I think there's a general lesson. And that is when we started looking at legal forms of land ownership to protect land and talked to several lawyers, you know, uh, environmental lawyers and human rights lawyers. So there are a lot of um, assassinations of an indigenous leaders and things like this. So the human rights and the environmental go together. One thing that was told to me by every lawyer was that you had to have three things in place for, for you to be able to protect a piece of land. You needed to have very good clarity about ownership. Who is the owner? How is ownership structured? And then it needs to be very carefully thought out for the context that it's in. You need the right legal form of management for the land. Is it a member-based cooperative? Is it something else? But you really need to have the legal ownership and the type of management need to be clear. But those two alone will not work if you don't have the third thing, which is active and persistent stewardship of the land. Just you could legally own the land, have a really good governance system. And if no one's there on the land to stop um, poachers or timber uh, people are coming in and stealing things, or the big thing in Colombia is mining companies coming and just killing all the indigenous people because they found oil or they found gold, uh, which is happening all over Colombia right now. They just kill them. And so there's active stewardship, people who are there on the land who will fight and protect it, which could be as simple as, well, I wasn't on my on my forest reserve for a week and someone put cows there. But because I go back regularly enough, I, some, I saw someone had let their cows in. So now I can go talk to the neighbor and ask them not to put their cows there. So this role of active stewardship is essential. And I think that relates to your question. Um, like I said, it's it doesn't explain it all and it doesn't apply to every context. But I just found it really insightful that without this active management, doesn't matter that you have the right management framework or the right legal framework. They all three have to go together. And um, jurisdiction can really be a problem if the national government comes and steals it, which happens a lot around the world. So what you're talking about is a very real threat, no doubt about it. it there's a long history of it. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, I'm just noticing the time and wanting to honor the time. So I think Maybe this is a good time for us to start closing off and say thank you, Todd, for that great set of questions. Super important. And um, what I'm wondering now is, so we're, we're at the time where we're starting to go over a little bit, but we still have several questions. And um, I don't know if I've given enough real world examples uh, for us to think with. Maybe give me a plus one or minus one in the chat box if you feel like I've given enough examples for you to start to understand what we're talking about. So give me the plus one if you feel like there have been some good examples, minus one if not, because that'll help me to just manage this more effectively than, than answering another question. Abel asked this question, what could be the shortest financial return cycle um, for a, a regenerating land? And um, what I would say is the shortest uh, financial return is um, instant or effective, effectively instant, which is that as we started raising money to buy a piece of land, it increased our inspirational capital to raise more money for community projects. And so while we didn't generate value on the land by you know restoring its soils and growing its forest and all of that, the inspirational capital went up simply by being successful at raising the money and buying the land. And if you follow the story of how difficult it's been for us to complete the payment on the land, our inspirational capital and our social capital went up 
as people trusted us to be so authentic and transparent during the process, that that has enabled us to generate revenue and has enabled us to form a local advisory council of regenerative Colombian leaders. So we built social capital and inspirational capital simply by successfully buying a piece of land without improving the financial value of that land at all. We're just starting that process. But this was instant. It was basically our ability to create an inspiring story generated more inspiration, which generated more financial returns and donations, which generated more trust for us to build other capacities in the community. And so you can see how the important thing here is to recognize how each kind of capital leverages the others. And then we can see that the time cycles of investments can be mul multiple different time cycles for the same process. The ecological returns is one thing, and the financial returns is another. The social returns is another. The inspirational returns is another. And they all interact with each other. And if we get really good at regenerative design, we'll be able to leverage one into the other. It's like, oh, we need money now, but we didn't before. We have all the social capital. Let's go and convert some social capital into finance by asking people to support our project or we really need political capital, and we have a lot of knowledge capital and social capital, meaning people trust us to do good work and they know we do things well, so we're able to mobilize them politically because they believe in what we're gonna do. So it's really the key thing here is to get adept at um, like alchemy of capital, to convert from one form to another. And that's what we're talking about doing here. And so, um, the question that I posed at the end of the presentation that I feel like we're getting at a little bit with the discussion, but how are we doing is the question. How are we doing at cultivating this regenerative capital, this regenerative finance within our groups and for the learning journey? And I think that's something we'll find creative ways to explore in the Zoom calls this week. But for now, I just wanna say, um, it's probably time for us to wrap up. We're a few minutes over our agreed time. And I really want to honor the amount of time and just say thank you all for these fantastic questions and great discussion. This has really been good. And I hope that you can see how, how we are creating an emergent set of content around what's happening. And we'll try to keep doing this well and in future weeks. And for now, I'm just really excited to see what happens in the community Zoom calls this week and seeing what we build upon with the discussion from today's webinar. So thank you all very much. And um, I'll see you all next week, same time, same place. Thank you everyone and have a beautiful rest of your day. <laughs>